it's it's really nice to be here because it's also an opportunity to merge my two lives, my, my real life with this transient life that I'm uh, experiencing right now. And um, what I'm going to um, talk to you about is um, some of the challenges that education systems are facing around the world. Uh, and we've been discussing some of these issues in the program so far. Um, and the way I'm going to phrase this challenge is basically what are we educating for, who we are educating, and how we have to educate to reach this, this purpose. This is not an easy debate. We sit the different governments of the world, sit in different forums, um, with UNESCO, with OECD, uh, in the European Commission, in our case, and uh, these debates are very heated. Uh, sometimes we think that we are using the same words and the same principles in the same manner, but when we go to the details, we are doing radically different things. So I'd like to give you a bit this uh, the image of this global debate that is going on, uh, these global challenges that uh, we are embracing right now, uh, to give you a bit of uh, just a small sample of the Portuguese experience what we are doing right now, and especially to try to discuss with you uh, one of the challenges, one of the bigger challenges that we face, which is this democratization of schooling. When we open the gates of schools to everyone, we have one consequence that is sometimes not very well understood. And the consequence is that the boundaries between formal education, informal education, non-formal education, get blurred, and this is very challenging for formal education and for non-formal education, because all of a sudden we don't know whose responsibility is for each of the aspects in which we are uh, uh, supposed to educate. But first of all, I'd like to give a big thank you for inviting me here. It's, it's very nice. For two reasons, I forgot my scarf, but uh, one of the reasons why I'm happy is one of the few occasions in the past two and a half years in which I don't have to wear a tie. And, and that's, that makes me very happy. Um, so, these are the challenges we have been discussing and I just mentioned. What is the purpose of education? And by this, we, have, we, we can have put this question in a different way. Uh, in all our countries, for sure, we talk about school achievement, school success. We want our students to thrive. We want our students, our young people, to be successful in their lives. But sometimes we forget to ask the question, but what is a successful person? What, what is the meaning of this word success? What does it mean to achieve? Then the second, the second challenge is who are we talking about when we talk about education? We talk about education for all, but sometimes we forget the significant part of this all when we design education policy. And it's very, very easy to, dis to design models of education for the privileged children, because they will learn anyway. Independently of the model, many times they just learn. So when we when we have in mind that we have to reach everyone, this is very challenging. And, and one, just anticipating a bit, one of the debates that we are having right now, uh, we are no longer just talking about quality education, as it is designed in the, in, the, in the SDG, but we are talking about quality education for all. Because it's easy to provide quality education for a few, it is very difficult to provide quality, quality education uh, for all. And then the last challenge is how do we educate? What are the means? Uh, what are the methods? What are the most adequate methodologies to reach the first purpose, the, the purpose, and also to reach uh, everyone? Now, some things are more or less um, almost common sense uh, these days. We are experiencing major changes in knowledge, in our relation with knowledge. The most obvious part of this is the technological revolution. Uh, 
many of us, if I mean, when I entered the scouting movement, movement 36 years ago, if someone had told me what I can do with a mobile phone today, I would say science fiction. That was the only, the only possible response. But we don't have to go back 36 years. We can go back only 10 years. And many of the things that we do today with our mobile phone were unthinkable 10 years ago. A couple of months ago, in a meeting with teachers, I, 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 I proposed a challenge. And you, you can also think of it for a while. I told these teachers, imagine one week of your life without Google. And one of them told me, I'm getting very nervous. Can it be just one morning? <laughs> she had no idea how to go around, how to look, prepare classes, uh, what to do uh, without, without Google. We are living a period in which knowledge is being produced at an incredible pace. Uh, I read some statistics recently showing that in 2015, there were more scientific articles produced in our universities than in the whole decade of the 90s. This puts a lot of pressure on education systems because then we want children and young people to know everything. They are supposed to know everything, but these days it is impossible to know everything. And uh, we have this a bit this schizophrenic relation with knowledge. We have all the knowledge in our pocket. If I ask you what is the population of Bucharest, I have no idea. But we, we go there and in a few seconds we have, we have the information. But when I say that this is a bit schizophrenic, because the fact that we have all this knowledge available makes knowledge very disposable. We immediately forget. And we forget because we know that you can go back there. But then all of a sudden we are camping and we don't have battery and we don't have Wi-Fi. And then there's some knowledge that we need to access even when we are in the tent uh, without battery and without Wi-Fi. And this is very challenging for, for education systems because then we have to define what is the most relevant knowledge. Um, this puts pressure on and, and creates new means of communication. We now so what I'm saying is being transmitted by YouTube to, to, I don't know who, maybe there's no one on the other side. I have made this illusion that I have millions of people around the world listening to me right now, but maybe only my mother is there and not even her. <laughs> so this is, this, is, this is difficult. This puts pressure on, on all of us. We have a relation with the news that is different want immediate things and and this has an impact on the quality of information so and, and technology in education is not the challenge by itself we have this generation of digital natives so it's not difficult to teach kids how to deal with the technology they teach us they they are born with the gestures like this instead of this so they know things much better than we do and much quicker than we do. But then we could think, okay, so with all this knowledge, with all this science, with all this technology, the world is a much better place. Things are going really well. And we know, unfortunately, that this is not true. We might expect that all the science in the world was making us live in a better place. But we haven't. These are just some of the challenges that we are facing right now. Climate changes. Water. Water is a big topic for this next couple of decades. There will be no water for all of us. A significant part of the world will not have access to uh, drinkable water. So many of the, if much of the investment on science and research right now is on this topic, water. What are we going to do if we don't have water? Uh, we have growing intolerance around the world. We have conflicts that make us think that we forget, we forgot the whole of 20th century history. We didn't learn anything with the growing of populism, with the growing of nationalism, 
intolerance, borders being built around, around the world. We still have major problems of, as we discussed this morning, gender equality around, uh, around the world. And this is being debated right now because if we have schools, if we have either formal or informal education, making sure that kids know everything about mathematics and history and chemistry and so on, but they are not equipped with the means to solve these problems, we are failing. And we are failing these students. And we are creating a big delusion uh, around, around the world. Because we think that we are educating them, but we are not preparing them for life, and we are not preparing them for what has to be their role in changing the world. And that's when we, and, and this title I, I put in the first slide, Education for a Better World, is actually the title of a paper that a couple of us in this 2030 OECD project co-signed a position paper saying, in very simple words, what is the purpose of education? The purpose of education is to create a better world. And, and, you, and you see that there is a shift in perspective. Uh, during, from the late 80s and in the 90s, the purpose of education was to develop the economy. But if the sole focus is to develop the economy, it might be that if you don't opt for the right economic theory, you make inequality grow. Uh, and now, uh, what we understand is that the economy itself has to be the means to reach this major goal. And we cannot have an economy that is based on a growth of poverty around the world, because the world will not be better. That's, that's, that's part of the framework that we are designing here. Now, for this reason, the, uh, the SDG uh, are in the agenda of all uh, debates on education. Uh, the, what we were seeing were just a subset of these principles here. And I, I remember a meeting we had uh, last year, and the, uh, I think it was the Australian representative said, OK, we have time. This is only for 2030. Luckily, we have time. And I told him, look, kids who entered school this year will be out of 12th grade in 2029. So this is not the future. This is the present. And this is about the survival of the planet. Therefore, it's about our own survival. So with all my respect for 16th century, 16th century poets, if we are too focused on making sure that we are reading exactly the same things that our grandparents read in school, we may be losing perspective and we may be out of focus in the, in the goals of education. Now, this is very, very difficult because the way the curriculum is designed around the world, this is not a Portuguese problem or a French problem, it's, it's like this box where you want to put everything. You want to put whatever you learned, whatever your parents learned, but also the new topics and the new challenges and the new problems. And then, you only have a limited time to be in school, but you want everything to be learned. And this is very difficult because we have a curriculum overload problem, a serious problem, and we have to make options. We have to make options, and there's a moment in which we sit and discuss, is this a priority? And we're trying to establish a global consensus on saying, this is a priority for education system. Now, the second challenge is, who are we educating? And we know that, unfortunately, many children around the world are not receiving education at all, or quality education. We know that there is a huge gap between boys and girls. So in many, many countries, girls don't have access to education, either because they are not allowed to, or because there is segregation and discrimination. And also one of the one of the premises of this, this work we are doing is that is is this one. It's education is about human rights. And it's very interesting to listen to students and, and I will I will tell you about our experience in listening to students 
and you will recognize my scouting background in the, in the, in the, in the design of education policy. But we, we gathered students from several countries in the West OECD meeting, and we invited them to help us, the politicians, to tackle the uh, equity problem. And we asked them, so how do you see school? And one student I get from the Netherlands said, this is all about privilege. Privileged children succeed, disfavored children don't succeed. And when we, when we address this problem seriously, we have to say this is about human rights. And human rights uh, have to do with social justice. And therefore, if we have education systems that are designed only for the privileged children, we are failing. We are failing in ensuring that this human right is, uh, is respected. And, and, uh, and the thing is, uh, when we, this equity debate is very, very difficult. It's very difficult to address because we have sometimes solutions that are not the, the good ones. So we have, if you see here, uh, I like these pictures because they talk better than me. But sometimes you say, okay, equal opportunities for all. But equal opportunities tend to forget that we are not all the same. We are different, right? And, and the debate on equity is, okay, let's, let's guarantee that they all reach the same goals, right? And that the barriers that there are for learning to some children uh, are, are not there because they have different means to get there. This is the reality, we know that some children are just uh, uh, overprivileged. But the goal is to remove the barriers and to respect the difference and to respect uh, diversity. So we are many times so focused on providing the means for everyone to achieve the same, but sometimes we forget that the problem is not the means, the problem is the barriers, and the goal has to be to remove these barriers, respecting the difference and the diversity. Because if we were all, if we were all the same, in, in Portugal there's this debate on, on how to organize classes. And there is a line, a tendency, that we are trying to correct, which was to organize what they call homogeneous classes, homogeneous groups. So you have classes of good students, classes of bad students, and one time you know, in a debate about this, I said, you know, I'm short-sighted. If I take out my glasses, you're all homogeneous. You all look the same. But then I don't see the difference and I don't value them. And I cannot treat you as individuals. And this is what this removal of barriers uh, is about. This is uh, when we're talking about in Portuguese, but you you read it. <laughs> uh, when we talk about when we talk about this uh, barrier removal, we are talking about a pass, a very difficult pass. When we're talking about equity, we are talking about a pass that starts in in exclusion and has as a goal uh, in inclusion. So if you take this is here, this is what we take as an example. Here is people with some kind of of disability, like me right now. So the, for many times, let me give you a bit the, the Portuguese history here. For many, many years, these people did not participate in society at all. If a family had a child with some kind of disability, this child would be left at home. Then in the 50s, last century, we took the first step, which was to segregate them. So all these children were sent to special needs schools and the others were in their own school. At the beginning of this century, we integrated them in schools, but they are not yet with the others. They are in units for children with special needs. In class, they have someone on top of them, make sure that they don't disturb the others. And now we just approve a new law promoting inclusion, promoting the removal of barriers to make sure that these kids all sit uh, with each other. And, and this is very difficult. This is the most difficult step. 
because this step here implies that some of these people will walk slower because they are walking with the others. And many people don't accept it. Some of those who say, yeah, inclusion is very important, do not accept that we all need to walk sometimes a bit slower to get further uh, with everyone. And then there are those kids who do not want to be in school. And we hear that a lot. We talk at the schools with teachers, with school principals, and say, yeah, but we have students that don't want to be there. And they misbehave. And they are kind of rebel uh, children in their classes. Uh, they hate school. And sometimes we forget to ask these children why they don't want to be in there. So my, my, my solution for this and this is the practice that we started two years ago, and we contaminated OECD with this practice, and here you see the influence, is to ask the students. Let's give them the voice. Let's invite them to participate in the decisions of the school. So what we started doing two years ago was we were starting to introduce changes in the legal system for schools in Portugal, and we had a tradition of listening to the academia, parent representatives, teacher unions, teacher societies, school principals, but we always forgot to involve the only ones who are really interested in the success, the students. So we did student meetings all around the country, student assemblies all around the country. We elected representatives of the students. They published a book with recommendations for the government on different areas of, of, um, of intervention of schools. And now I'm very happy to share with you that we just approved the, the new law and the curriculum, and one article in this law recommends that schools have to promote regular and systematic uh, spaces for students to be heard about curriculum development and the effectiveness of how they learn. Uh, very easy to put things in the law. It's very difficult to stimulate practice, but that's the, ne the next step, is to continue this. this is a, these are just pictures of these student meetings, these student uh, involvement meetings. This one is when they presented the book on, uh, they, they call it The Pros of Education Inspire. And then it's a very nice book just with quotes from what they heard around the country with. with. So what we're doing is to have, to try, to make sure that when we're talking about education, we are talking about everyone. No one can be left behind. No one can be left outside. Uh, I had a recent experience. A student who had a case of violence, extreme violence in the school. He was going to be suspended. I visited the school by accident. He was still there. And I made the obvious thing to ask him why not to justify an act of violence, but to try to understand what, a, what was going on. And first he didn't want to talk to me, but then I insisted and I pushed, and he grabbed my arm and he said, no one knows, but I'm alone at home for a week because my whole family was, was arrested. And then we expect that this teenager sits in class in the same condition as the one that, you know, had breakfast and, uh, and a good night's sleep and everything. It's not fair. It's not fair. And when we give students the voice, we can understand them better. Then the third challenge is how. How do we do this? And we have, uh, we know that we have, this is, this is a, a very old picture in which we have this factory-like kind of education. Students are all expected to process whatever is in the books and not question anything or they are expected to think and act exactly like the teacher even if the teacher is wrong so school and this this has been studied it's a bit sad but it is known that school kills creativity many times we have there is a, a, a very nice study done in the, in the united states with a cohort of students that was followed for for, for a decade, and they studied the creative thinking of these children 
in a, in a preschool, and they followed them up until they were, I guess, in ninth grade, and the creative thinking was dying out. So the effect of schooling was negative for creativity. Why? Because of standardization. Kids are expected to reproduce whatever is in the textbook, to say exactly as the teacher said, instead of stimulating their independence, their critical thinking, their autonomy, and their ability to look at problems and solve them. And sometimes we think that we are doing uh, the right thing. You cannot read this, but sometimes we think that putting a machine, a device in the class solves everything. Now we are being modern. Now we are being fashionable. What this teacher is saying to the students are just go to www.criticalthinking.com and click on answers. So sometimes we think that if we have a device, we are solving the problem. But this is not what this is about. It's also about assessing. This is a very famous picture in which the, the teacher is telling to the different animals, for a fair selection, everywhere, everybody has to take the same exam. Please climb the tree. And we, we assume that fairness comes from equal means, equal, equal treatment, equal assessment tools. But it can't just be the way to promote that. Those who are already able to do something will pass, and those that have different characteristics will fail. Now, what we see and what we've been, we are discussing now, and this is when we talk about this OBCD uh, 2030 skills, we are trying to identify what is the set of relevant skills for students to be able to succeed throughout their life. Not to succeed in school, to succeed throughout their life. And the stage at which we are right now is we are going from theory to practice. So now we want to study schools and cases in which it is possible to do things in a different way. And um, anticipating a bit what I'm going to say at the end, uh, we see that many of the aspects and characteristics of non-formal education are invading schools. So we know that when we take characteristics like problem solving, empathy, the ability to cooperate, reasoning, critical thinking, effective communication, these are skills that you achieve better when you learn by action, when you learn by project, when you have problem-based learning and project-based learning, and when you work in groups. This is a bit familiar to everyone in this room, I guess. Uh, and it's interesting to see how this is now having an impact on, uh, on formal education. This is the design of the OECD learning framework. Uh, the first thing we had to, to address was what is, school, what is school supposed to teach or to promote or to develop? And in some countries, in the recent past in Portugal, the word competence was banned from all our documents because our predecessors thought, no, school is about knowledge. You have to be knowledgeable. And that's it. But if, if it is all about knowledge, it's all about memorization and rote learning. And this is the best way to make sure that we don't learn. Because then what happens is, I memorize, I put everything in an assessment, in a test, in an exam, and the next day, I forget. So I'm not actually learning. And then there was this dichotomy that was being established between knowledge and skills. So if it was either or, if you have knowledge, you don't have skills. If you have skills, you don't have knowledge. This is the most hollow debate that I have participated in, because what is to be able to do something, but you don't have the knowledge underlying this ability? And what is the purpose of knowledge if you're not going to do something that with it? So uh, the, first, the first area of agreement is that 
we need knowledge and we need skills. And here we have disciplinary knowledge, but also interdisciplinary knowledge. This is very critical right now. When we think of those global challenges that we are facing right now, take climate change, for instance. This is not the problem of biology, chemistry alone. This is the problem of biology, chemistry, geography, philosophy, about ethics, about moral and, and political philosophy. Um, it has to do with procedural knowledge, but then you need skills. For instance, we are discussing a lot in this project the role of social and emotional skills. If, take the example I just gave you of this child whose family was arrested, will he be able to learn with these emotions like this? This is also a problem of school. The minute, you, the minute we decided to open the gates of the schools to everyone, we have as a consequence that social, social and emotional skills are something to be developed uh, in, in, in the school. And then we have a very, very difficult debate about attitudes and values. We know what happened in the 20th century. Most of our scientific advances were made to kill during World War II. So if we have knowledge and skills, but we don't have the right framework for values, this knowledge may be used in the wrong way. But that's the most difficult part, because then we have to establish who decides what is the right way and the wrong way. Which values are good, which values are bad. And this is a very, very heated debate in this, in this project. So when we're talking about competencies, we're talking about this crossing of knowledge, skills, attitudes, and values. And then here we get to the purpose of all this. We place the student in the center. This is also commonplace. Everyone says that the student is in the center. But the goal of the whole thing is not the student. The goal of the whole thing is well-being, this concept of well-being that I talked to you about uh, before. So, this idea that we won't educate individuals so that they take action on their own life and on their community's life to promote good things, to promote a world in which everyone is well. Now, let me just tell you a bit what is happening in Portugal, what we are doing with all this, and we have this. Uh, um, mutual influence in Portugal. So we are very actively participating in this project, this OECD project of 2030 skills. Uh, and we are benefiting from what is being built in this project. And the project is benefiting from what we've been doing uh, in, in Portugal. So just to give you some background, we have, I'm, I'm very proud of our education system. We have uh, 44 years of democracy, so we have 44 years of democratic school. That's when we open the gates to everyone. And we have very, very good uh, uh, numbers. And I'll, I'll just mention uh, two of them. We had in the 60s and 74 was more or less the same. One quarter of our population could not read and write. And in 40, 44 years, we went from 26% to 5%. This 5% this is still big. We are not happy about it. But this decline in the rate of illiteracy is uh, almost unique. Few countries manage to, to go so fast in such a, a short period. Another number we had, we had before. We had 1.3% uh, of high school enrollment in 61 around 40% in 74, and now this, this number is no longer updated. We have more than 80% of our uh, adolescents in, in high school. Again, from 1 to 80-something uh, in 40 years is, is a lot. Uh, also, this is just a graph showing the early dropout rates in Portugal. We only go back 20 years, and we have 50% of early dropout. So half of our students, this has an impact now 
on the qualification of our adults. Many of our adults have low skills and low qualification because they dropped out of school too early. So we are investing on adult qualification right now because of this. But we went from 50% to 12% now. Still, we are one of the worst countries in Europe. We are not happy about it, but it's a very good uh, evolution in, in 20 years in this, in this case. And this is now, everyone is excited about Portugal in, in, at the OECD in particular because we have a constant rise in PISA, uh, in the three domains, uh, numeracy, literacy, and science. Uh, I sometimes tell people, so there are some news around the world saying Portugal is the new Finland, and I say, no, we aren't. We aren't because we are happy because we have a constant progress, but we are halfway the table, and we have a big, big challenge, which is equity. So, what we, we could say, okay, with all these numbers, everything is done in Portugal. We are very happy. Unfortunately, not. We have retention in Portugal is very, very high. We are one of the countries in the world where students uh, fail most with the higher levels of retention. And almost one third of our students do not finish high school in due time. It should be three years, they take longer. Uh, and it's a lot. One third is too much. We cannot be happy about it. Now, why aren't we happy about it? We could say, well, it's a problem of numbers, a problem of statistics. No, it isn't. The problem is, first, the quality of learning. This means that there are many students who are not actually learning. And above all, a problem of social justice. Why? Because the main predictor of retention in Portugal is common to other countries, but in Portugal it's very, very strong, is poverty. Rich kids pass, poor kids fail. And this is not fair. If we have an education system that is designed only for the privileged children, this is not good enough. This is not, uh, this is not. Now, this is very, very complex. It's a very complex problem. Because what you see is the predictor of retention is outside the school. It's the socioeconomic status of the families. But the, predict the predictors of learning are inside the school. And this is a very difficult, this is a very difficult mix. Now, I will not bother with this. This is, this is the structured response we are giving to this problem. It goes from investment in preschool to this adult qualification problem. I'd like to focus on four of these uh, areas. The first one, very much aligned with the 2030 skills, the first thing we did was to launch a national debate on, okay, what is the mission of school? What do we expect from a student after 12 years of, school, of compulsory schooling? School is compulsory from 6 to 18 in, in Portugal. And so we, we had a very much participated debate on this question, and this led to the formulation of a student profile with the identification of 10 areas of, of competence. Language and text, information and communication, reasoning and problem solving, autonomy and personal development, critical and creative thinking, scientific and technological knowledge, interpersonal relationship, individual and collective well-being and health, aesthetic and artistic sensitivity, body awareness and body domain. Now, you do not recognize individual subjects here. Try to find chemistry there. You will find it in different areas of competence. Uh, you do not find geography there. You will find it in different areas of competence. So this is the purpose of school. It's not how you implement uh, uh, the, the, the actual learning. The other area in which and I already gave you some notes about this, the other area of intervention was, OK, let's define a legal background for inclusive education. So we departed from a clinical model on inclusion. What we had, what we have until now, is a, a model based on diagnosis and referencing. You're autistic, you do that. You're dyslexic, you do that. You have hyperactivity, you do that. This is not about inclusion. It's about labeling kids and taking them out of the way because they are not part of it. So we turn this model upside down, 
we base it on a model of access to the curriculum, and the principle is everyone has a place in the classroom. And it has to be the classroom that adapts to this child and not the child that goes somewhere else to make sure that it doesn't disturb the, the, the classroom. Another thing we are doing, this is very, very difficult, lots of resistance. We are trying to touch the evaluation model. We cannot say that we want kids who are creative, uh, who have aesthetic sensitivity, who are critical, analytical, but then we, don't, we only assess them in memory. This is the best way to kill creativity, critical thinking, reasoning, interpersonal relationship, and so on. So what we're doing is to stimulate schools to diversify the assessment teams. We, we, we have samples of schools in which we ask them to count what is the percentage of the different assessment tools. And in many cases, we have 80 or 90 percent tests and then other things. And then the other things many times is what they call uh, social, it's to see if the kids are quiet in class, not whether they are participating. And, and we're inducing some changes here, diversifying to have projects, to have portfolios, to have participation in debates, to have oral presentations, essays, uh, interdisciplinary projects evaluated in different, in different subjects. We also introduced a performative assessment at a national scale. So we have assessment on arts and physical education for the first time. This is a revolution. Schools were not prepared for this. It's, it's a mess to organize this in schools. But what we want to induce is to say assessing is not only pen and paper. There's more to assessment than that. And also in this assessment in basic education, we are not returning a grade. We are returning a report with qualitative information on the students. The idea is, using someone's image, if I go to the doctor to show my foot that doesn't move, I don't want the doctor to look at me and say, nine. I want the doctor to say, this is what you have, this is what you need to do, this is the progress you made so far. And this is what we're trying to induce uh, with, this, with this model. Then, different very difficult work. We are identifying what we call a core curriculum or an essential curriculum. We want schools to develop awareness for gender equality, for the problems with climate change there, but this imposes that we look at what you have right now, which is huge, it's gigantic, and we identify those core areas that all students have to learn to give the space for two things to address these new challenges, to address the areas of competence of the student profile, and to include. Sometimes the barrier for inclusion is the curriculum itself. There's so much to teach that students who need more time don't have a space in the classroom. And the only solution is to set them aside. This is very, very difficult. We are doing this with teacher societies. And it's very difficult because it's very easy to find them worldwide consensus saying the curriculum is too big. But then, where do we cut? Take history. Which part of history is not relevant? Do we take away the Romans or contemporary history? Where do we do the cuts? Very difficult. People get very mad about this. If their own thing is taken away, it's not. And then, uh, the final thing I'd like to talk to you about is we, for all this project uh, to go on, we uh, increase the autonomy of schools. Uh, so we invited schools to do uh, two things. One was to uh, use, actually use their autonomy. Uh, the idea is you cannot, if, if school underachievement is a complex problem, uh, it's a number, but it has behind these numbers are many local problems. Sometimes it's the neighborhood where the school is that is not promoter, promoting, you know, a, sen a good sense of community there. Sometimes it's problems with the teachers. Sometimes it's the flat. Sometimes it's a student that is disturbed by any reason. We cannot have a national solution for a problem that has 
hundreds, thousands of, of, uh, of sources. So we invited the schools to design their own programs to promote uh, better learning. And for this, we also gave the schools the ability to take 25% of the time they have in the year and to develop local projects for interdisciplinarity, for problem-based learning, for, for projects that students develop. And we piloted this during last year, and it has it is now been approved as a law to say schools can do this. Uh, let them be free. Let them work. That's basically what we're saying. Now, final thing uh, I'd like to say is that uh, all of this has to do with a big challenge that we are facing. As I said several times during my presentation, we open the gates of schools. So the world before democratic schooling was very well designed around these clouds. You had formal education, which was actually not education, it was instruction. So school was meant to instruct, and teachers could say, education is at home, I instruct, I teach. And if you don't have the good manners from home, go away. At home, in informal education, it was not about education, it was about manners. That's, that's what the school was expecting, that the students brought the good manners from home. It was not the teacher's uh, uh, role. And because you had very poor qualified parents, there was no instruction at home. That was the whole role of, uh, of, uh, of schools. And then you had non-formal education, movements like ours, scouting. But that was a bit occupation. So, if you have free time, be a scout, be happy there, have fun. But this is not supposed to teach you anything. Or if you play soccer in your neighborhood, that's okay, you learn to play, but that's it. That's not serious. That's not a serious thing. Now, what happens now is completely different. Schools cannot be based on the idea that there is a family behind giving board of values, because sometimes there is no family. Sometimes the family is in jail. We have refugees getting in some of our countries, and they don't bring parents with them. They're alone. So can we base our education system on the idea that there is a family to promote social and emotional skills that before democracy were part of the family's responsibility. Uh, also, can we really believe that students will learn if they don't feel well in school? They won't. We, we will fail. Um, so motivation became an important part. And sometimes we hear that they don't want to be here. They, don't, they are not motivated to be in school. Again, let's ask them why. Let's ask them why they don't want to sit in school. This is no longer a family's problem. It's everyone's problem. And then we have these reciprocal influences. I just mentioned some of the, some of the, the tendencies now in education are methods that are very well known from non-formal education. When we talk about small group, when we talk about cooperation, when we talk about project, this is old news for us. Uh, we all know very well how to do this. But then, scouting is no longer the sole owner of these methods. Schools benefit from these methods, uh, and we also benefit from some of the things that came from schools. Intentionality, sometimes. We, we no longer talk about just making a game. We want to know why we are doing this game. We have educational intentionality. And that's why right now, whenever we think of education, we don't have these very well-designed borders. We have what I put there as a community, uh, a community's conspiracy. The family has to be there, but when there is no family, there are others. The non-formal education systems have to be there, but not everything is based on that. 
uh, school incorporates this, but above all, schools collaborate with the others. So, for what we are discussing right now is no longer the education systems, but we are talking about education ecosystems. That's the only way to go. And when we take a child and we put the student in the center, we are not taking the student as a unit in a school. We are bringing the student to the center with the whole set of relations that he has. Family, community, or non-formal organization, and so on. This has to be consequential. For instance, one thing we are developing in Portugal is the, the Youth Institute as what is called the Youth Pass, where the students, where young people can register all kinds of informal activities that they participate in. What we are doing is to bring this into the students' diploma. When they graduate from school, there's an hyperlink to their Youth Pass. Why? Because being qualified is not only about formal education, it's about this whole set of competences that are being developed. And I stop here with my political inspiration on education from Mandela, who says education is the most powerful weapon which you can use to change the world. So this is a good battle, and we'll keep fighting with this weapon. Thank you. Thank you very much.